The U.S. reacts to Russia's intervention in the Ukraine. We talk with a priest on the ground in Kiev. For the third time this year, a snowstorm gives hundreds of thousands of federal workers here in Washington a paid day off. The people called him the good pope. We remember blessed John the 23rd tonight in preparation for his canonization. And this mother superior who once shared an on-screen kiss with Elvis joins us with reaction to the Academy Awards. Those stories and much more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, March 4th, 2014. Thank you for joining us. I'm Brian Patrick and for Colleen, we begin tonight looking at News Now. Ukraine is still grappling with a Russian military takeover of the Crimea Peninsula and the southeast section of the country this weekend. Secretary of State John Kerry is in Kiev today showing support for Ukraine. The U.S. also promised to give a billion dollars in aid to the former Soviet Republic. But Russian President Vladimir Putin is defending Moscow's right to use military force, saying the troops are protecting Russians who live in Crimea. Meanwhile, on the ground, Russian troops have taken over Ukraine's Belbak Air Base. They were firing warning shots into the air. Both the U.S. and the European Union are talking about economic and diplomatic sanctions against Russia to isolate them. We're firmly convinced that there needs to be a peaceful solution to this current crisis in full respect of international law. So we call on Russia to immediately withdraw its troops. There is the ability for Ukraine to be a friend of the West and uh, a friend of Russia's, as long as none of us are in uh, inside of Ukraine trying to meddle uh, and intervene, certainly not militarily, uh, with decisions that properly belong to the Ukrainian people. Earlier we spoke with Father Zerhi Zakarchenko on the ground in Kiev about what it's like to be in that situation today. It's very important uh, to hear uh, Pope's voice. He asked all Catholics all over the world to pray for the Ukraine. And this is uh, really very important for us, very important to strengthen us and to support us with prayer. Father Zerhi said the Pope's appeal for peace in the Ukraine is a great source of strength, especially for Catholics there. Now some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team has been covering in today's world. President Obama is unveiling a nearly $4 trillion budget proposal. Today, the president visited an elementary school here in D.C. to highlight how he wants the government to finance more pre-kindergarten programs. The administration's 2015 budget blueprint also includes proposals to upgrade roads, enhance job training, and expand tax credits to cover millions of low-earning workers with children. Political experts say the proposal gives Democrats a playbook for the economy in the election year. Republicans in the House have criticized the budget, many favoring less federal spending. Well, the snow is still slowing down. Travel and canceling some classes this week in the Mid-Atlantic and the Northeast. Up to 10 inches fell on cities along the East Coast. The storm brought the nation's capital to a halt, closing down the federal government for the third time this year. We caught up with a few hardy souls who braved this later, latest winter storm. I thought I was escaping the bad weather coming down from Boston, but it seems like it followed me down to D.C. So. I don't believe that the government should shut down over a little bit of snow. And I've always gotten excited about snow days when I was a kid because we, we could play. Don't talk to air travelers about that. More than 2,100 flights in the U.S. were canceled early Monday. With government offices closed, many federal workers and contractors stayed home. Many high-profile guests attended a memorial service for the late Nelson Mandela in Westminster Abbey this week. The music of South African singers and drummers filled the 13th century Gothic church. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was there. He was joined by Prince Harry and Prime Minister David Cameron. In his remarks, the Anglican bishop thanked Britain for its anti-apartheid work. Federal police have seized this ancient Roman statue from a storage site in New York. Italian officials claim the marble reclining woman was looted from Italy decades ago. They think it's one of the many ancient artifacts brought to the U.S. illegally by convicted art trafficker Gianfranco Bacchina. Authorities say they don't know when the statue entered the U.S. People in Brazil are celebrating on this Fat Tuesday. Partiers danced in the streets at a big parade there. Rio's Carnival is considered the largest Mardi Gras party in the world. Carnival officially ends later tonight as Lent begins on Ash Wednesday tomorrow. 
It looks like Pope Francis will continue to grace magazine covers. One of the largest publishing companies in Europe is launching a new magazine called My Pope, hitting newsstands tomorrow. It'll cost 50 cents and include a pullout poster with a memorable Pope Francis quote each week. And Pope Francis is opening up the gardens to his summer home. The Castel Gandolfo Gardens will now be open to the public for 90-minute tours. They'll be offered in both English and Italian and be available Monday through Saturday. If you'd like to go and get more information, check out the Vatican Museum's website, mv.vatican.va. Of course, we all know Arizona Governor Jan Brewer vetoed that bill last week that would have given business owners in Arizona the right to refuse service based on their religious beliefs. The story's playing out very differently in media. Some say the bill's about religious freedom, while others say it's anti-gay and discriminatory. Molly Hemingway, senior editor at The Federalist, joining us on EWTN News Nightly to talk about the bill and how the media did in covering the story. Molly, who would you say presented this in a more accurate way? Uh, very few people presented it in an accurate way. It was an overwhelming, the coverage was overwhelmingly flawed. Almost every media outlet, whether it was broadcast media or print news or anything, local, national, they portrayed this bill, which was a broad religious liberty bill, as anti-gay. And it was, uh, it was almost as if they hadn't read the bill, even though the bill was only two pages long. Uh, it, they just, they, they did not cover the actual content of this bill well at all. In fact, let's t look at two specific headlines, these tweets that we'll show you. The Washington Post called this an anti-gay bill. And of course, uh, on the other side, the Wall Street Journal got it as a religious freedom bill. How can two news sources take the exact same bill and have such a different way of looking at it? Well, it, it speaks to a larger problem that the media are having right now, which is how they cover religious liberty in general. And we've seen this with how they cover uh, religious attempts to fight the contraception mandate in, in Obamacare. And, yeah, and now you're also seeing it with this Arizona bill and similar bills. These, this legislation is actually not that hard to understand. It's something that we have at the federal level. The, it's called RIFRA, Religious Freedom Restoration Act legislation. And this was a, this was a tweak at the state level of a bill that, that provides broad religious liberty protections to people of all religion and none. And in fact, when this bill was started, it was started to protect uh, the worship practices of Native Americans from government uh, encroachment. Do you think the reporters just don't get it, or are they intentionally misrepresenting? I, you know, I think that it's true that reporters sometimes struggle with actually understanding things. They're not, uh, we are not the brightest people on the planet, and we sometimes struggle to understand the things we cover. Uh, but I think also this speaks to a larger issue of activism in the media. And on this issue in particular, reporters just struggle. They have a hard time covering this objectively or with any semblance of fairness. And we're seeing the fruits of that now, and it actually hurts civil discourse in America. This was a bill that really needed to be debated and thought about in, in a considerate fashion, and that's not what happened. And certainly the discussion about this continues to be very heated. What do you do with the Federalist? How do you try to bring politics and culture together? Yeah, we, we cover a broad array of topics, politics, policy, and what we found is that all politics is cultural, basically. And also all politics are imbued with, with what one's understanding of virtue is. And so we try and talk about what virtue is in all of our pieces and how a virtuous people lead to a free society. All right, Molly Hemingway with The Federalist. Thanks for joining Thank us. Thank you. Coming up, we go to Rome with Lent rapidly approaching. Alan Holdren talks with John Paul II's biographer, George Weigel, about Rome's station churches. And later on, we reflect on John XXIII, who called the Second Vatican Council in the 60s, leading the reform that Pope Francis is now continuing. Watching EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. With Lent beginning this week, author George Weigel is in Rome promoting his book Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches. Our Rome correspondent Alan Holdren caught up with Weigel today. George, uh, you're here presenting a new book on the Station Church Pilgrimage. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Station Churches are? Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches, Alan, uh, tells the story of the revival of an ancient Lenten tradition here in Rome which is a pilgrimage day by day, beginning Ash Wednesday and ending on the octave of Easter to a specific church each day for daily mass during Lent. This tradition began in the fourth century of Christian history 
fell into disrepair in the first centuries of the second millennium and has now been revived by the North American College here in Rome, such that for the next six and a half weeks, beginning tomorrow morning, uh, some 300, 400, 500 English speakers throughout the city will go to each one of this fixed schedule of churches uh, for the next uh, month and a half, recreating an experience that began in the fourth century. And I assume you're going to be there tomorrow morning. I am going to be there tomorrow morning at Santa Sabina with my son Stephen, who was the photographer on the project. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we were to just look at one particular church, and we looked at the church of Saints uh, Cosmos and Damien, what can you say about that particular church that stands out? Saints Cosmos and Damien is an interesting church, both architecturally and decoratively. Mm -hmm. It's near the Colosseum. It's built out from uh, a building in the old Roman Forum. Uh, that was given to the church in the 4th or 5th century. And it has one of the most startling apse mosaics uh, in the city, indeed in the world. The first time I saw it 20-some years ago, I thought it was 20th century Art Deco. Uh, it's in fact uh, 5th century, 6th century mosaic work. It's a great mosaic of Saints Cosmos and Damien with Saints Peter and Paul. It's one of the last examples of artistic naturalism uh, in Rome for many, many centuries. Uh, it's the kind of place you only discover on the Station Church pilgrimage because Cosmos and Damien is not on the beaten tourist track in Rome. And after the Station Church pilgrimage is over, we have Easter and then we have uh, the Divine Mercy Sunday, which is the canonization of John Paul II. As uh, his biographer, uh, what's going to be going through your mind on April the 27th? Obviously, a lot of memories of him. Uh, a canonization is the church's official statement that this person lives in the presence of God. And I suspect I'll be thinking at some point during that day of the last line I wrote in the memorial piece on John Paul II for Newsweek back in 2005. I wrote then, he is now where he has always wanted to be. This was a Christ-centered man who wanted to live in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of the Trinity. And that's what we'll be celebrating on Divine Mercy Sunday. George Weigel with our uh, Alan Holdren, and you can find George's book, Roman Pilgrimage, The Station Churches, in the EWTN Religious Catalog. Meanwhile in Rome, Pope Francis continues to make a name for himself as a reformer, but he's not the only pope who paved a way for change. This is Movie Talk. Leslie Mitchell reporting. Blessed Pope John Paul XXIII was born Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli in Soto il Monte, Italy in 1881. He was ordained a priest in 1904 and became Pope in 1958 at age 76. That's the same age Pope Francis was when he was elected. Blessed John XXIII was the first pope to bear the name John in 600 years. During his papacy, he spoke often about peace and issued the encyclical Pacem in Terris, or Peace on Earth. But he's probably best known for summoning the Second Vatican Council. The council reformed liturgy, ecumenism, and interreligious dialogue. In his 1962 inaugural council address, John XXIII made clear the council wasn't going to change doctrine, but to evangelize to the modern world. John XXIII did keep some traditions alive. He wore the papal tiara and was carried in the ceremonial throne, as you see here. He was known for his humanity. In fact, he was given the nickname the Good Pope by the people. Another example, Blessed John Paul XXIII is a trailblazer. He will be canonized after only one miracle, not two, has been formally approved. And as we continue our Saints for today's special series tomorrow night, we'll have an exclusive interview with Hartford Archbishop Emeritus Daniel Cronin. He was the attache to the Cardinal Secretary of State under John XXIII and worked side by side with this saintly pope. Well, here in much of the U.S., the bitter cold and snow means the homeless are packing into shelters. About 1,300 people are staying in Catholic charity shelters here in our nation's capital. Students from one Catholic school are bringing some warmth to them. EWTN News Nightly's Jason Calvi has more. Granola bars, applesauce, crackers, and these messages. 
stuffed into paper bags by the 215 students at St. Peter's School on Capitol Hill. Well, it really means a lot because in the cold months like winter, I feel really bad when people are just out on the streets, they don't have a home, they don't have shelter. When they don't have food, that's horrible. But I feel really good that our school is doing this and I think it helps a lot of people. These 1,500 breakfast bags will feed the homeless. It feels good to be helping people. Kindergartner Jane is drawing on the bags with her favorite shapes and colors. Because some of them might be their favorite colors. Students from each grade work together in groups called families. Be gentle, guys. I've learned that you have to work together to get stuff done. Can't reach. The older students can learn that responsibility and uh, take care of the younger ones and show that leadership. The eighth graders lead their groups in four service projects a year. Teach us to turn our gratitude into action to help those who have less than we do. It's important for our students at a young age to learn to serve others, to be mindful of others and their needs. We have so much to be thankful for here and so we need to learn how to give to others. From here, the bags go to one of five homeless shelters run by Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of Washington. It's part of their Cup of Joe program, sending food and a message of hope to those in need. Um, I want them to know that a lot of people really do care. It's nice to like help them. Jason Calvi, EWTN News Nightly. Good teamwork, guys. Up next, Mother Dolores Hart gets to vote on the Academy Awards. Years ago, after starring with Elvis, she left Hollywood for the convent. Mother joins us tonight to discuss this year's Oscar winners. And we're all sick of winter. We have a taste of spring to share tonight. Flowers depicting the works of great artists. Stay with us. What a great pleasure to have Mother Dolores Hart joining us from Hartford, Connecticut. She's a contemplative Benedictine and also a voting member of the Academy. Mother Dolores made her Hollywood debut opposite Elvis Presley with his first film, even got a kiss from the king on screen. Mother Dolores, it is so good to have you with us this evening. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. What did you think of this year's winning film? I was so happy that the, it was the uh, 10 years a slave. I really thought the United States needed to see this win because we needed to give back and we needed to say that we have a capacity for honesty and for remorse because I think that brought up in everyone a sense of we would never want that to ever happen again. Well, that is a film that I really want to see, Mother Dolores, and you were at the Oscars in 2012. What was it like, and how does the Hollywood elite react to a nun being there? Well, at first, they thought it was in costume. So, <laughs> um, the, and a lot of my friends whom I know, um, it, when I was in Hollywood, they're no longer on the earth. Hopefully, they're with the Lord, and so there was a lot of new people to meet. And actually walking on the red car carpet, I have to say, it was a little like going in the Colosseum in Rome. You felt like you were walking in with lions on both sides. Well, thanks for sharing that experience. I can just picture you there. Of course, you acted with Elvis when you were much younger. Tell us yes. what that was like and, and that experience in Hollywood for you. Well, it was, it was amazing. I knew believe me that God was present in my life because it was about 40 or 50 gals, blondes, who were all standing in line wanting the same part. I could not believe that I was chosen. And when, I fi when we finally met, it, I'd been in school and he said, how do you do, Miss Dolores? And I said, oh, how do you do, Mr. Presley? What do you do? <laughs> and of course, <laughs> that started a great relationship. What fond memories. And we'll talk more about how you transitioned from Hollywood to the convent at another time. But we want to mention your autobiography, The Ear of the Heart, an actress's journey from Hollywood to Holy Vows. It came out last year. It's available in the EWTN religious catalog. Mother Dolores Hart, thank you for joining us by Skype from Hartford, Connecticut, and we appreciate your perspective on the Academy Awards this year. Oh, thank you very much. 
Oh, those songbirds with Mother Heart, they're hopefully our heralding spring in Connecticut. We can only hope and pray. Of course, the other hot topic at the Oscars was fashion. Verily Magazine picked their favorite looks of the night. Naomi Watts topped the list. Here you see the actress in a white Calvin Klein gown. Olivia Wilde was also one of the picks. Her Valentino dress left room for her new addition. Penelope Cruz looked regal in her Giambattista Valle. British actress Sally Hawkins sparkled in Valentino, and best actress Kate Blanchett wore Armani Privé. Early Magazine was founded by a group of women who felt women's magazines don't reflect their lives or philosophies. Verily says it features fashions that complement the dignity of women rather than compromising it. Check it out at verily.org. Well, if the cold has you looking forward to spring this year, there's an exhibit in Philly you may want to check out. It's a flower show, but it caters to art patrons. Take a look. Gardening is an art, but it's not usually abstract art. Here at the largest indoor flower show in the U.S., plants have been carefully cultivated and engineered to look like famous works of art. Now through the end of this week, thousands of visitors will come to this warehouse in Philadelphia to trade the winter landscape for this floral wonderland. Everyone is so sick of snow that um, coming in and seeing color and seeing the flower show, it's going to be a welcome respite this year. In the entrance garden, aerial dancers pay tribute to Alexander Calder. He's best known for popularizing the mobile, a moving sculpture made out of suspended parts in this case, plant parts. We are always out there looking for the best flower and the most different variety. We have some new variety of carnations that have never been seen before in our exhibit. Steps away, floral designers got together with New York's Guggenheim to replicate an abstract painting with those carnations. The circles appear to be placed randomly until the viewer stands on a pre-marked spot. Suddenly, it's Kandinsky's circles in a circle. And as they enter that one forced frame and look through the frame of the uh, exhibit that you're seeing behind me, they will actually see the painting come to life as it was originally meant to be. Winter weary gardeners and painters alike may find inspiration here at the flower show. It's a welcome burst of color at the end of a long cold winter. And of course, we're just hours away now from Lent, a new liturgical season. There's an app for that. EWTN is launching a brand new app, Challenge for Lent, the Daily Lenten Scripture Reading Challenge. If you download our free EWTN app and complete the challenge, you'll read through all four Gospels by Easter Sunday. If you already have our app, the Scripture Challenge is part of the update. Well, until tomorrow night, we invite you to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter, and you can catch us again on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. We'll see you on Ash Wednesday. Thanks for watching tonight. May God bless you. Good night.